Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center, home of the Tina Turner Museum. Thank you, Emily, and welcome everybody to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Emily, as usual, before I introduce today's very special guest, what is something you have discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? We've been researching and talking all about ag for our National Ag Day in our greenhouses, so I learned that the top three U.S. farm products are cattle, corn, and soybeans. That is um, very good. Thank you so much. A lot to discover on ag out in our Simmons Bank Ag Center and looking forward uh, to the greenhouses that are coming. Um, Today's guest is Mary Brown. Mary is a writer, speaker, mediator, and philosopher, and most recently, she is a workplace conflict restoration consultant, and we're going to um, we're gonna discuss all about that. We're going to probably hit on every single one of these um, before we get done. Welcome, Mary. Thank you so much for having me, Scott. It's ha- I'm happy to be here. So before, you know, before we get into uh, workplace conflict um, restoration, I want to find out what, what your, your uh, philosophy is. Uh, instructor has kind of been your uh, primary area of interest uh, to this point. Um, for for folks listening who don't really know, I, I know that if you Google what is a philosopher, because I was curious, so I looked it up, it says a person who seeks wisdom or enlightenment. And I thought, well, that's a great way to spend one's life. So how do you define what it is that you do? As a philosopher, I think that's you know, that's what I tell the students on the first day of class. I taught for 23 years and philosophy itself means a love of wisdom. And so a philosopher is somebody who wants to know what's true more than what they hope is what's true. So it's an investigation about what is real in the world, what exists in the world, how do we know what is real, um, what is the good life? And of course, that question we think about with philosophers, what is the meaning of life? or what brings meaning to life. And so um, as a philosopher, you're investigating all of those things. Uh, philosophy itself is, you know, 2,500 years old or older than that. And so um, professional philosophers have spent their life working on these different issues. Um, and today, a lot of philosophers are, are ethicists, doing bioethics, doing um, questions about what does it mean to know, um, a lot, lots of interest in philosophy of science, um, what is good, all these sorts of questions. Um, and another another part of a definition that I saw said, a philosopher is a person who is rationally or sensibly calm, especially under trying circumstances. Um, so <laughs> I cannot imagine any more trying circumstances than we've all been through together um, yeah. in the past uh, couple of years. Do you feel like uh, philosophy has been a tool that you've uh, utilized to s- get through the pandemic? I think so. Um, philosophy, the tool that the philosopher uses is the mind, right? So you think about the tool the scientist uses or um, any any sort of discipline. And so what the philosopher uses is, you know, tries to employ critical thinking skills. So um, we try to distance ourselves from the idea or whatever's going on to be able to look at it from a variety of points of view. And um, it's a recognition that there are a variety of points of view and we come to how we view the world in in different sorts of ways. And so it's an investigation and we put together arguments. Um, And so uh, my husband and I, who my husband's also a philosopher at UTM, and uh, whenever we say something, let's say about the pandemic or something else, it will give an argument and then the other person will either agree or attack one of the premises or say, you know, uh, this is all friendly, uh, you know, questioning, well, why this or why is that your evidence or how did you come to that conclusion? So I think it's helpful. Um, 
Um, I, my, my um, goal for this year was to try to be more present and less distracted uh, in, in both work and my private life. So I'm going to ask you some more questions about that in a few minutes. But first, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. Tell me a little bit about where you came from and what your childhood was like. Well, I came, I'm from Bakersfield, California, which is um, the, the rural part of California. So when people think about California, they think about um, Southern California or Northern California. But actually, I came from um, Bakersfield, which is in the valley and is a very agricultural. My parent, my dad was a pest control advisor um, for the majority of his career. And uh, so I grew up in what I thought was this little tiny town of Bakersfield, which is about half a million people. But, you know, I was I, I grew up in the shadow of L.A. And to me, that was the big city. So I grew up um, in Bakersfield and then I went to college at Azusa Pacific University, which is in Southern California, uh, by where the Rose Bowl is, um, Pasadena. Um, and I thought I wanted to be a psychologist. And then my uh, freshman year, first semester, I had a philosophy course and it was like the heavens opened. And, you know, when you find your people, you find that thing that interests you. I, I realized I had always been that kind of person. In other words, I drove my parents crazy with questions, <laughs> uh, the huge questions about the nature of existence in the universe. Um, and then from... Um, from um, APU, I, I ended up going to Western Kentucky University for my master's degree, uh, where I met my husband. So now, when I think about when I think about um, Bakersfield, I think about music. Yes, There's the Bakersfield sound, and right. uh, you know, I have this. I've never been there, but I have an image in my head of honky tonks everywhere, and, <laughs> and sort of a Nashville version of in California. Is is it like that? not my experience but you know but you know I was young growing up I mean my experience lots of fields I mean there are the tumbleweeds um there's pretty much two seasons uh because it's a desert so uh, winter uh for for winter it was you know barely ever froze I think it snowed one time and the summer is just incredibly hot and everybody says it's a dry heat but when it's over 100 it's just hot you know yeah. So, yeah. So Bakersfield is extremely sprawling. Um, unlike, um, yeah. So it's a, it's a very laid out, um, town. It's kind of, kind of hard to explain. So you, you didn't hang out a lot with Buck Owens? Um, <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I knew where all the, the Crystal Palace and these, these other places were, but yeah, I was a little bit too young for that. And, and I read where church was a big part of your family's life. Um, and then did that influence in any way your uh, wanting to dive deeper into the meaning of life and things like that? I think probably. Um, I grew up, um, I had a Baptist background. Uh, and the church that I went to in uh, California was, was Baptist, but it was more kind of a non-denominational. And uh, was very, I spent a lot of time at church in high school. In fact, that's where I spent the majority of my time. And I was always interested in questions of theology and um, purpose. What was my life for? What was I supposed to be doing? What, where, what really was the good life? And um, so interestingly, when I um, decided to major in philosophy, I actually got quite a bit of blowback from people in my church because um, it can sound scary to people of faith um, because we're not quite so sure how faith and reason intersect where I see them. Thomas Aquinas said that if you want to do good theology, you have to have your philosophy straight. He said that philosophy was a handmaiden um, to, to theology. And I think he's right because philosophy helps organize our thinking, um, gives us all the tools to whatever it is that we want to do, whether you're a religious or non religious person, um, it can really help, help us structure our, our thinking. And so you're uh, teaching a subject to, you were teaching a subject to students um, who were in a transitional time of life, many of whom are, you know, having different problems for the very first time. So you really, having, having to, not having to, but those who chose to take your class, 
I probably found a lot of help in how they solve problems in in that phase of life. Is that correct? Well, I sure hope so. I don't know how many of you interviewed all the thousands of students that I have had. Um, philosophy is complicated, and um, I think it's difficult as a pretty young person to kind of understand, like, what the heck are they doing? What What is Socrates up to? He sounds like a, a mean bully. But to to really kind of understand the reason um, to um, make distinctions, the reason to think through um, the reason to be able to distance ourselves from an idea. Uh, a lot of times we'll say, I'm pro-life, I'm pro-choice, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. And we hold that as a per- part of our personality instead of being able to take it out externally and reflect on it and think about um, different claims. And so I hope um, that through the difficult material, I mean, that was always my hope, was that more than the content, I wanted them to develop their own critical thinking skills. What, what did they think? And, um, you know, many times people will end up thinking very similarly to their families or where their region where they grew up. And I think that's fine as long as we honestly come by it, as long as we do the intellectual work to realize what are my reasons for this political or this religious or this worldview. Um, and so I, I hope, my hope is that I've been able to help people with that. Do you feel like do you feel like teaching philosophy and applying philosophy to everyone's lives is different in this particular era that we're in where politically you know people are so divisive and there there really is there really are areas where there it, where people are just in direct conflict. Yes, um when there's a certain level of hostility or um incivility, it makes it, people have their defenses up, right? And so we talk about the cancel culture, people have their defenses up, and especially young people, because they don't, you know, they're in fear of being canceled. They're in fear of saying the wrong thing. Um, and and that's a, a stopper to uh, learning and growing and developing. And in general, the only real way to have a, an actual Meaningful conversation is if you have to trust the other person and you operate with the principle of charity. And the principle of charity says, I want the good for you. I want to us to grow and develop together instead of the gotcha society where you misspoke. And so now we're going to publicize it. You misspoke. And now we're going to grind you down for our political purposes. That does not encourage people to move forward. That is detrimental to a democracy. If we Don't give people the space to think and grow and develop. In fact, when people change their mind, we say they're wish-washy. I mean, don't we want people to learn and grow and develop? Um, So I think it is hard because the the culture, it's more like you've got to pick a side instead of why, why are there sides instead of ideas? Why not? really learn and grow and engage. And so I I think with it being so polarized, it's like we're told we have to choose, you know, which party do you belong to? What is, what are your beliefs? And if you can't say that with like absolute certainty, hundred percent on the bandwagon, then there's something wrong with you. And people fear being out of community. They want to be in community. And so it, it shuts, it shuts down growth. And so what, what advice, if you could counsel all of America, <laughs> what advice would you give us? Well, my, my main advice would be love your neighbor, right? And if we really think about what love means, love means I genuinely want the good for the other and, you know, love yourself as well. So I want the good for my neighbor and the good for myself. That means that I don't, it's not my job to make my neighbor believe something or think something or be something. It is my job to love my neighbor, to flourish, to try to work together. Um, And we just focus so much on our differences. And there are differences. I don't want to minimize that. But, you know, when you love somebody and you disagree with them, it's much easier to find a workaround, to find mutually satisfying resolutions. But if you've already vilified the other person, why you want to quote unquote give in, why you want to give them any leeway, because you've probably told yourself 
if you give them anything, then they're gonna, you know, you've done some sort of slippery slope. You know, this will lead to this, will lead to that. But if we could really start seeing our fellow neighbor as fellow neighbors, as partners in our community, partners for our children and our grandparents, partners in how we treat the earth, how we treat resources, how we just treat one another, then we can, I think, stop um, this false dichotomy that we've fallen into that is us versus them, because that's not going to help us and it's not going to help them. And then to, to bring it closer to home, you know, a lot of those kind of things can be applied to our work lives and working yeah. with, you know, we spend more time at work than we spend at home. Um, and so at what point did you start to have a sliver of an idea that maybe what you're doing in the classroom might be able to be applicable to those of us in our jobs? I think I've always thought that philosophy I always bristled at the idea that philosophy is just an ivory tower discipline, that you just have professional philosophers and they're doing this extremely complicated philosophy and it doesn't make a world of difference, that it's just really something for the university. But when I've read and thought, and there's so many different kinds of philosophies out there, I always think it's very practical because it's, I think, interesting advice about, you know, how, how to live your life and, and things to think about, even if you don't agree, but why don't you agree? Anyway, I, I've always thought it was very practical and dealing with students. And when people would major in philosophy, uh, their poor parents would you know, be so afraid. Like, what can you do with this? What world, real world application? And as I started thinking about that, how would I advise my students as what you could do? Um, and thinking about my own life, um, I, I decided that in the summers, um, I might try to do some mediation. And um, for, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, I started looking into that. But then more recently, I found Rule 31 mediation, which is in the state of Tennessee. Pretty much if um, you are going to go to court, before you go to court, um, the judge is going to order you to mediation. And mediation is fabulous um, because you put the power back in the parties who have a problem. And they have another another chance to solve it on their terms instead of some judge who doesn't know them um, making some sort of final decision. And then, of course, it um, more you know it makes the, the whole process of, of court you know just gums up the system. So I became a World Thirty One mediator in um, two thousand eighteen, but it turns out that I already knew teaching is a full time job. Even in the summer, I was still working, and I have three kids, and I have a husband, and. A, social commu um, commitments, and I, I couldn't really do that. And then the pandemic hit, and I just realized that it was time for a mid-career shift, that I absolutely love teaching philosophy, love the students, but I wanted to do something else. I wanted to do a different kind of, try to make a different change in the world. And you know, I've worked in a lot of different places, and I'm sure you have too, and everywhere you have people, you're going to have problems. That's just the nature of humans. And I thought if I could do something about toxic work environments, if I could help people have better work environments, then that's going to help them individually. It's going to help the company. It's going to help their own family unit, whatever that might look at, because they're going from a healthy environment um, home. And it helps the, just the community at large to have healthy people, healthy businesses. And that prospect just um, was so exciting to me that. Um, that's what I decided to do. You know, I mean, I have worked in, I made a list of all my jobs at one point and it, I, it was like 35. So 35 <laughs> plus different, you know, jobs. And, right. you know, they're all very different. And the people that make up the jobs are very different. But some of them, you know, I should go back and rate them on, t you know, how toxic they were or not. You know, <sighs> you, you, when you're working in a good, uh, when you're working in a good uh, work environment, you know it. And when you're yeah. working in a toxic uh, work environment, it's it's almost um, unbearable, you know. Yeah. So for for folks out there listening who are in a toxic work environment, who who dread going to work, yeah. you know, what are some of the tips you can give them, you know, on how they can address it 
maybe leaving is not an option at this time. Right. And so right. if, you, if you're going to, my choice was usually to leave, but mm-hmm. you know, as you get older, that's not always the choice that you can make at that time. So especially in a rural community where there right. may not be as many um, opportunities. So, so what are your, what's your advice on how to address as a worker, a toxic culture at work? Um, it's a good question. Um, one thing I've decided what I wanted for my business is to directly talk with bosses and CEOs because you need psychological safety to really engage in difficult conversations because they're difficult. And if you feel like there's going to be blowback, you're going to lose your job, you're going to get a bad assignment, there's going to be some sort of repercussion, you're probably not going to do that, right? And so if you start with the top of the organization and um, but it's a whole, actually a whole organization. It doesn't just, it's not just a new program the CEO is putting in place and then putting on everybody else. It's a, actually, it's a system-wide where everybody's engaged in this project, but it has to be values-driven. And if you, and it's how do we treat employees' values? A lot of times organizations will, they'll have their mission statement. They'll talk about how they're treating stakeholders, uh, specifically what it is that they're about and how they're going to do it. But there's little talk about how are you going to treat employees? Are you going to treat them as cherished customers, as partners? And so what I want to do is I want to help um, in the entire business develop basic values, three to five values that get infused in everything. And then this, when you, and then you train and empower people to have difficult conversations. But let's suppose you don't have that, right? So we, you're just in a toxic work environment. My best advice is um, how all problems get solved, and that is starting with yourself. And so let's suppose that you're embroiled in some sort of conflict with your um, a person at work. The first thing that you need to do is, is stop and think about, well, what is really going on? Because probably by now, if you're calling it toxic, you're going to say, you have a story about this other person. This person is unbearable. This person um, just doesn't want to play well with others. This person is just awful and they're out to get me, right? They're, they're just very big, grandiose statements. And we end up vilifying the other person. There's nothing good about this other person, um, nothing redeeming about them. They're just a terrible person. And so my advice would be to think about what story are you telling yourself about the other person? Okay. So what do you, what story are you telling yourself about the conflict and, and, and realize what it is that you're saying. And, but then start thinking about what specifically, what is the specific behavior that you're having a problem with? And what so much we want to do is we want to change people's personalities. And the first thing you've got to do is you've got to give up on that. That's wishful thinking. That's not going to happen. So it's not even really desirable, I don't think. But what you can do is to focus on behaviors. So what is one behavior that you find difficult? And think about why you find it difficult. And think about how could you address that other person, right? Or when you think about that behavior, like they're always taking your favorite mug or they're parking in your parking spot or they're eating their tuna sandwich at the shared desk, you know, whatever it might be. When you think about that one aspect, that one behavior, is it something that you legitimately can live with? Is that something that maybe it bothers you, but you can widen your scope of acceptability? Maybe you can accept it, but if you can't, talk to them very briefly. Say, hey, Sally, I have this problem. Um, This is supposed to be my parking spot and you're parking in it. Tell me about that, right? So you've named specifically what the problem is. You haven't said, and you're a big bully or, and you know, you make everybody's life miserable. You've just named the, what you've observed. And then you've asked Sally, you've invited her into a conversation and now you listen to it. That's adult to adult conversation. That's finding the specific behavior, addressing it, listening, and being open to really working with that person. Right. You're not, and, and that's, really how it begins. It's this whole preparation process and then starting to see, let's say Sally is the person you're having a problem with, starting to think as if Sally is impossible, start thinking about, well, what is Sally saying about this problem? Who loves Sally? You know, people probably really like her. Maybe you don't, 
But that's not a problem with Sally. It's a problem with you two together, right? It's like oil and water don't mix, right? They separate. But oil mixes with a lot of things. Water mixes with a lot of things. And so it's humanizing, having empathy. And when we start bringing the person-centered approach into workplaces and start seeing other people as actual people and not villains, that we change and then we can affect a change in others. Do you think... You know, I've lived other places, and I found that um, when I moved back to the South and started working, the culture of the South and people being polite mm -hmm. and nice and not using their words to express their feelings was in many ways a negative that that could lead to some negative uh, workplace uh, scenarios. Have you found any kind of regional impact that the South has? Yes, absolutely, especially in a small town, because that person that you're having conflict with might be your mother's best friend, or it might be a neighbor, or it might be a distant relative, or just a, a close relative. And so there's one reason we don't deal with conflict is because of the interconnectedness of relationships, but they get uh, even more tied up in fraught when you have smaller communities. And then you have um, the niceness of the South, which is... Um, is wonderful and then also has a possible negative repercussions, just like maybe the harshness of the East, it has um, positives but negatives. And so I think what it is, is um, realizing that, you know, so how do you work within the culture that you're in, right? Not, you're not trying to change the culture. I don't even think that's a good idea um, because regionalism is wonderful. As one thing that's great about this country is that it's sprawling and interesting. And so if you're in the South, and you know that politeness is key, great. So how do you work within that? But it is not nice to allow people to continue behaviors that are detrimental to you and to the company and to the community. That is not nice, right? Absolutely. And and do you see, no matter what part of the country, do you see some of the things we talked about earlier now more than ever creeping into corporate culture, you know, like cancel culture and my rights and what, you know, I want to be heard, you know, I'm yeah. right, you're wrong. Do you see that um, creeping into corporate America? And as a CEO, I'm curious um, how you advise CEOs to make certain that the place that everybody's working at is the opposite of that. Right. Well, I, there's a lot of things I can say, but think about human resources, right? So someone decides they want to go into human resources, probably because they like humans and they want to help. What are most human resources offices today? They're like the right arm of management. They're litigious. Um, and by the time a complaint gets to HR, it usually makes things worse. We have a win-lose scenario instead of a win-win scenario. Uh, uh, and it really becomes us versus them. And so in our society in general, we are just very litigious and we make company policies, not for the good of the humans, but for to try to stave off lawsuits. And well, I'm saying, of course, it's good to stave off lawsuits, but one way we might do that is by humanizing HR, making it walk up people in culture, organization, where it is human focused. How do we treat each worker with dignity and respect? you know, the golden rule, and so to speak. But how do we do that? How do we personalize in an age where we are obsessed with um, uh, mechanation, um, with um, all the different kinds of digital measures that we can get when you hear the things about Amazon warehouses where people are, you know, commodified and watched constantly in every little thing they do. And they, you know, <laughs> The conditions just don't sound very pleasant if you want to have a good human existence. So does that mean we have to give up productivity? I would say absolutely not. When you treat your workers with dignity and respect, with autonomy, when you train them, when you empower them, when you get higher productivity, less unnecessary turnover, more buy-in, greater ideas, um, loyalty, right? But why would someone be loyal to you if you're not if you don't know them, right? And so empowering managers, line managers to have people skills, to get to know the people they work for, to find out what their real concerns are, to find out where you can be flexible. Um, all of these, it's, I think it's, 
it reminds me of what happened with phones. You know, like um, phones used to be like cell phones used to be ginormous and then they got smaller and got smaller and got smaller. And then they got so small that they, <laughs> our little finger, our big fingers wouldn't work so well. So they got to get, they got bigger and bigger, right? And I think that's where we are right now, trying to find our way with technology, finding out where it works and how beneficial it is. But then sometimes where it's actually detrimental because we have to realize the overlay is it's supposed to help us and help the humans, right? And if it's not, then we need to pull back and see where that, that marriage is. And of course, we've got growing pains. Um, it's not one or the other. I think it's both and. I want to step back just a second and ask you, there's a lot of folks listening who are working in one job but yet their heart lies somewhere else and they're thinking about making a midlife career change like you did. Uh, what was some of the thinking that went into that? You know, was it a little scary? Did you just close your eyes and jump? You know, uh, for those of, for, for those out there thinking about that, what, what are some of the things they should consider? Well, personally, it was very scary. And it, even though it happened in a way overnight when I told my boss, um, David Coffey, who I worked for the history and lesson department at UTM, um, that I wasn't going to be returning in the fall, uh, you know, just happened, but it was about a four year process of realizing that, um, I was becoming dissatisfied that I, I wanted to do something else, um, that I started developing this other vision. Um, and then investigating, okay, well, I'm committed to staying in West Tennessee my um, my kids are here. My husband has a full-time job at the university that he loves. I'm not going anywhere. So what are the opportunities here? And so I started looking around and seeing this new vision I had for my life. So it was a long process, but once I decided to do it, it was very scary. Um, and when I left, I thought as soon as spring semester, this past spring semester was over, I would go right into rule 31 mediation but it, as luck would have it, I read this particular work by David Little, um, who owns a company in the UK, about workplace conflict management. And that was another light bulb moment for me. And I'm like, oh, no, this is what I want to do. And so it took a while for me to realize there wasn't a company around here that was doing what it is that I wanted to do and that I didn't want to work at one company. I wanted to go from company to company to try to make and train people since I'm I've spent over 20 years as an educator that that is something that I am good at. So going around and trying to encourage people and train them and going to the next place. And that eventually came to the realization that I'm going to start my own company. And it was so exciting. I love being a small business owner um, and frightening. And uh, uh, yeah, it's both, it's both every day is a wonderful and difficult and uh, yeah. Well, to transition from, um, you know, my wife works works in universities, and so to transition from academia, yeah, into small business, and for you, big business as well, because you're consulting. It's night and day yeah. kind of cultures and worlds. So it must be, you know, you must be learning something new every day. I'm guessing. I am. I mean, so academics talk a certain way, and my entire professional life has been at a university. Um, besides like small part-time jobs I had. Um, and one thing that I guess I might say is embrace being awkward. So um, I've been going to ribbon cutting events and I've joined the Wakefield County Chamber of Commerce and the Bayan Chamber of Commerce. And I plan to join the Jackson one, getting out in the community, uh, meeting people. And that's um, my life for the past 18 years has pretty much been on the third floor of the Mandy's building in my office and teaching students and not going out to the community besides, you know, soccer games or tennis games, things like that. And, um, but I know what it is that I want. And I, I have such a passion for helping people in their workplaces that it means I have to go out and do these other things, which I have found so enjoyable. I have just absolutely, I didn't know how much I was going to enjoy going to O'Brien County and, and, and listening to this person speak or, or meeting that person and getting to know more about my community has been fabulous and just the, the world of business. Um, but when it comes down to it, I might change language to talk to a different kind of clientele, but it's just dealing with people and it doesn't we, matter where you are. 
I think embrace being awkward is such a valuable statement because we've all been in those moments where we feel like we're standing out, you know, we're doing something that nobody else, we're doing something that's different for us and it's challenging and a little bit scary and just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm, and that's actually where you and I met was at a recent ribbon cutting ceremony. Um, and, um, as I've told you, you know, I, uh, met you and, uh, you told me what you were doing and we talked a little bit about that. And then literally moments later, my daughter texted me and said, she was really thinking about, you know, she's majoring in psychology and some other things. And she said she was interested in HR and, and, in workplace, you know, uh, psychology. And I was like, that's insane. And so I connected you to, and you went to coffee and, and she really mm-hmm. loved to get to meet you and talk with you. So it is crazy putting yourself out there. I personally have found putting yourself out there and embracing being awkward pays off yeah. tenfold most of the time. Yeah. Every single time I've done something, I have met one person. Um, and that is fantastic. And it is amazing to me when I think before I started this journey, I had heard, well, what are the opportunities? There are no opportunities around here. This is a small town. I need to move to a big city. And I think one reason I didn't do this move sooner um, in careers, because I believed that. And I mean, the stars aligned for me to leave when I did it. And I have absolutely loved my time at UTM. But um opportunities, it just sounds so cliche, but the opportunities come because you make them in the sense of just putting yourself out there. Yeah. Those opportunities were there because I wasn't there and I hadn't done the work to get there. So for the first couple of months of my starting my company, it was all what I call thought work. I was putting together my website. I was putting together my copy. I was really trying to hone what it was I was about, who my clientele is, what, and I'm still in the process of doing all of these things, but um, and then meeting with people, people that I know, the people who then put me on to other people, who put me on to other, right, networking. Um, and it, it is about as you go out and you just try the new thing, now you have new things to try because you've opened up one area, which opens up other areas. It's been, it's been mind-blowing. It's been amazing. Um, you, in addition to all this, you also wear another hat, that of an author. And yes. when we get back from the break, we're going to talk about uh, your books and your writing. And that's a particular, a, an area of particular interest for me as well. So I'm looking forward to, to continuing right after the break. The West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownsville, Tennessee at exit 56 off I-40 offers an authentic Southern experience showcasing the history and culture of rural West Tennessee. Inside, visitors can learn about the history of cotton, explore the scenic and wild Hatchie River, and get to know the legendary musicians who call West Tennessee home. Also located on the grounds is Flag Grove School, the childhood school of Tina Turner, and the last home of blues pioneer Sleepy John Estes. To learn more about the center, visit westtnheritage.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Mary Brown. Uh, We've been talking all about um, her new gig, uh, consulting with um, organizations and companies on uh, mediating a workplace conflict, but she's also in her quote-unquote spare time, if you could call call it that, with three uh, uh, children. We'll find out how old they are. Um, but um, I'm curious about her writing, and I know that she gave the you gave the keynote speaker at the 2021 Young Writers Conference recently on Why Write. So uh, that's a good place. So tell us about your kids first, your children, and then tell us about why should why write. Well, I have three kids. Um, the oldest is 20, and I have an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old. And uh, I started writing when my oldest was maybe 10 or 11, and he started reading all these uh, young adult books. And I was interested in what he was reading. And um, because I'm a philosopher, I was a little disappointed with the metaphysics, so the background, the world building. And I thought, "Ah," and I had an idea, and I thought, I'll give it a try. So that's the 
how I got started writing, which I never thought I would write because I'm dyslexic. And so I just never thought that was for me. Um, no, d- dyslexia, you know, there's a wide spectrum of it. And for me, it just shows up um, the spelling and inverting of numbers. Um, so it's not severe, but it is enough where I thought, well, why would I want to torture myself uh, with writing? But um, since then, I've written eight books. That's great. Um, and so did you um, – do you self-publish or did you start writing and then you tried to get someone else to publish or what route did you particularly take? Well, when I wrote my first book, um, this is quite a, a while ago now, and um, it was sort of um, the end of vanity publishing where, you know, you go with a publisher that you pay and you get like a thousand books in your home or something. And the beginning of PO, um, print on demand with Amazon. And then there's traditional publishing. And of course I, well, I tried the traditional publishing route first and writing the query letter and um, sending it out to all these different people and the query letter, which is a one page summary of your book and you, um, it's extremely difficult. And at this time, um, the book business of course started to shrink and um, the where you could buy books, it's just so much has been going on in the book industry that I decided I'm going to try to self-publish. So um, pretty much since then, I've sent out a few query letters, but um, not really. I like self-publishing. Uh, I do it through Amazon, through uh, which was Create Space and whatever they're calling themselves now. And, and, and Ingram uh, Spark. And yeah, um, yeah. No, I did. I did the same exact thing you did. Uh, you know, my first book was. Uh, published by a publisher. And then I went through that whole thing, you know, like I'm sure you took the same course as I did online and, you know, where you learn how to draft that particular sample and who to mail it to. And I actually had some meetings with uh, book editors in New York to talk about some of my ideas. And, you know, I just was turned off by the whole process. Talk about making yourself uh, in an uncomfortable situation, um, you know, but through that process, I did learn about self-publishing and about, you know, it just opened up a whole world for me as well. So, you know, I think that's really the wave of the future. You know, it, it's unfortunate. I think the negative of self-publishing is there are some, uh, people who won't even consider covering your book in the news if it's not, you know, there's there's this machine out there um, that you know about that f- f- in the book publishing world that has been slowly being dismantled for the last, you know, five to ten years. Um, yeah. So it remains to be seen. But um, so what what uh, did you find most rewarding about publishing your books? Well, um, it's certainly the writing. Um, the writing is so much fun. For me, and there's different ways to write. And so um, the majority of books that I've written are um, young adult books. And some people, when they write, they have a whole outline and they have done all the creative work ahead of time when they sit and write. And that's not how I write. I had an idea and I kind of had in mind a little bit of a story arc, like I kind of thought maybe I knew what was going to go. But for me, what I love so much about writing is the creative aspect, showing up and you think, oh, okay, this is what this character is going to do. And then be like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. And this idea comes and you're typing furiously away to get, make sure that idea comes out and you're, and you're just shocked about this new development in this world that you're living in. Um, and so I am a bit of a creative person and I, I like that. And the part about publishing, which I think is fun, um, not as fun as the writing, but you know, deciding on the artwork, deciding on uh, some other aspects, you have complete creative control, which is a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's all up to you, but then it's all up to you. Um, So the whole creative aspect is definitely the best. I'm going to ask you about your book that just came out, but first I want to find out, it's interesting, your your, your children, they are starting to get to the age where they're going to be going off to college um, and you're going to be sending them off to the, to the, in the same way that you've been on the other side, accepting students in and, right. and, and teaching them. Um, how's that going? Has your oldest uh, gone off to college? Yes, he's actually a junior at UTM. And, okay. um, you know, it's funny you say that, but as soon as, so when he was a senior in high school, um, and I, at that point, had been at a university for almost 20 years, looking at the university from a parent's perspective, so different. Um, you know, when you think you know the ins and outs, it's much different than 
applying for housing, applying for this, uh, just seeing it from another perspective. Uh, my uh, 18-year-old, he's a senior at Westview, and he's going to go to University of Memphis next year. So, um, yeah, so looking at that, it, it feels so foreign. I think, why does this feel so foreign to me when I've been in this world? Um, but yeah, it's much different teaching than being on the other side. And then uh, your youngest, um, what grade is your youngest? He's in eighth grade. Okay, so you've got a while before yeah. you've got empty nest going on. <laughs> That's right. Um, but I remember, you know, the first the first time I took my oldest daughter to college, I was just a wreck. You know, yeah. like I even I even cried, and I don't cry. And then <laughs> when I took the the youngest one, I was just devastated. Yeah. Um, and then, but everybody kept telling me, "Don't worry, they come back." And that's absolutely the truth. So for any parents out there listening who's who's in that stage, you know, it's not as bad as it feels like it is in the moment that you're in. In fact, my wife and I enjoyed Empty Nest so much that if we could have done it sooner, we would have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's probably because teenagers are not always a piece of cake. Yeah, but. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so um, it, do, it does all work out in the end. Um, but it is interesting. I'm sure, um, I'm sure you take into consideration things that a lot of us um, a lot of us don't um, as an educator. Um, so tell me a little bit about your current book. Uh, it's it's um, uh, obviously um, a topic that a lot of folks out there are having to deal with. The name of the book is The Food Addict, Recovering from Binge Eating Disorder and Making Peace with Food. So tell us a little bit about that. So this book is about um, really what the title says. It's about food addiction and about a binge eating disorder. And um so I yo-yo dieted for 25 years and, um, I it would go on a diet, lose weight, uh, fall off the wagon, gain it back. Right. Just a cycle since I was in high school. And then I eventually came across, um, this diet that, uh, I thought I was cured. I thought it was cured of my food issues. I had lost more weight than I had ever lost. And I just felt so free and so good. And i started a, a local club called the Existential Eater Society, and I had a blog, and I was just all in, and then the same thing happened. I fell off the wagon, and I had given up sugar on this on this last diet, and um, when I fell off the diet, uh, I developed binge eating disorder, and binge eating disorder, there are three main eating disorders, anorexia, which most of us know about when you don't eat, bulimia is where you eat and throw up, binge eating disorder, is the third one. And that's a kind of uncontrollable eating. And I kind of explain it this way. It's like, which I have done, being in a stranger's driveway, not hungry, but having gone through a drive through and you're like shoving fries in your face while you're crying, you know, locking the door, eating food. Um, and not because you're hungry, but it's compulsive, right? You can't stop. So I developed a binge eating disorder and along with a clinical depression. And I was so mortified at my own behavior. I was so um, disappointed with myself. I had never experienced this before, and I hope to never again, the feeling of despair, of being so disappointed that I had done it because I thought I had conquered this lifelong demon, and I hadn't. And I just couldn't look at myself in the mirror. I couldn't get out of bed. And so a process of therapy and, um, antidepressants and I went on a spiritual retreat, reading. And about a year and a half later, I came out of it. And it's, I realized what put me in this, this state. Um, and it was this dieting. And so I said, okay, I'm never dieting again. And that became my mantra. I'm not on a diet. I can eat what I want. And as soon as I did that, food never longer, no longer held the same weight to me anymore. Because I legitimately believed I could go through any drive through I could eat anything I wanted. Um, and sometimes I would just to show myself, see, you're not on a diet. And I really started believing that. And I lived that way for six or seven years until my metabolism changed. And I was at a weight, as I call it, my happy fat weight, which I was fine with. I could move just fine. My health was fine. Um, I'd given up on my dream of having this, you know, model body. And, um, but then I started gaining weight and I didn't know what to do. And I, I talked to my doctor who knew about my eating disorder and she recommended taking weight loss medicine. 
Well, I grew up in the eighties. And to me, that was like a no go. No, no, that's like speed or that's, you know, that's not good for you. I'm not going to do that. But I considered it and I started taking weight loss medicine, but I told myself, I'm, well, I'm not going to diet. And so I thought, well, maybe I could thread this needle of taking the medicine, but not changing what I ate. And it was hard for the first three months because my brain um, kept on saying, you're losing this opportunity. If you just restricted your food, you could lose more weight. Um, but I was able to push through. And that's why I decided to write this book. I decided to write this book because through this process, I realized that I really am a food addict. It doesn't go away. Like an alcoholic who um, can be a recovering alcoholic, but they're always an alcoholic. That's how I think of myself as a food addict. Right? So condition has to be managed. Right. So when I have crazy thoughts about food or feelings, I'm no longer surprised by them, but I have a plan of how to deal with it. And I wanted to tell my story because the mantra I've told myself, and I think our culture says, is that the problem is you're overweight uh, because you eat too much. So stop eating so much. Problem solved. And so it makes it a moral problem. The problem is lack of self-control. I lack self-control. I eat too much. I shouldn't eat so much. I need more control. Right? And so it's this, this control issue. And I came to realize that's not it. First of all, that's not the problem. The problem is not that I'm eating so much. I always thought the, the problem was external, the food. The problem is in my mind. And so I had to start thinking, taking my mental health seriously. And uh, once I realized that the whole way our culture has set up about eating issues, especially if you're overweight, it's just wrong. And what we need to do is empower people with giving them their specific tools for them to deal with their issues. And I think medicine, for some people, that's one of the tools. Talk therapy. Um, there's just a variety. Speaking with a dietitian, um, journaling. There's so there's so many different avenues out there. But we don't tell people. We say it's about dieting. It's about restricting and self control. And I just think that's a losing way. And the obesity epidemic is so devastating on the individual, on the healthcare system. Uh, just personal happiness that we need to do something different. So we need to stop shaming people and telling them that they're morally broken and instead offer a variety of help. And that's what my, I decided to write this book um, was to try to show people that there are a different ways um, that they can approach their problem. And I also wrote this book um, for people who don't understand eating issues, right? There are people who just really don't understand what's the problem. Stop eating so much. And so I tried to include, and I was as honest as I could be. I cried all summer long when I, when I read it because it's really painful. So for people who don't understand why their spouse, why their loved one, why their mother, why their father, why their child is overweight. Now, not everybody has my issues, but it's one person's perspective um, that I hope to shed some light and further the conversation so we can actually make progress on a really difficult and important topic. And what, what um, is the meaning behind the cover? Uh, it's a striking cover, but I'm curious, uh, is there uh, symbolism behind it? There is. Thank you for asking. Nobody has asked me that before. Um, I love the door because I think about doorways as possibilities. And I hope that somebody takes away from my, my book, not that, oh, I'm going to do what Mary did. That's not, the, that's just what worked for me. But the, the thing is, open your own door, open up possibilities, look in different ways, get different kind of help to solve your problem, because there is a solution. But we limit ourselves when we don't have access. And so that's why the door is there. So go through that door, find what's on the other side for you, because there is something on the other side. Which is also a lot, you know, ties back into the embrace being awkward, you know, yeah. put yourself out there. Cause you know, you, I mean, here you wrote this book, um, about a very serious topic, made yourself very vulnerable. Um, do you feel like there has been a reward to going this route? I think it, it has personally, um, it has, it's amazing to me how everything in my life seems like it's all the same thing. It's all about solving problems. Right, whether it's intellectual problems with my students, um, trying to have intellectual skills to deal with problems, this big monkey on my back of eating, 
um, now into the workplace. Uh, but a lot of it is being self-aware. And I, through writing this book, it made me really have to think about um, a lot of different issues. And so it has personally been very satisfying. And a lot of the comments I've gotten back is, Mary, did you really want to be that vulnerable? And I'm a pretty, actually, I'm a pretty private person. Um, and I felt really good about the book because I think it's worth sharing and I'm not ashamed of it. I think that's part of it is we shame people so much for their weight issues. Um, but I'm not ashamed of it because it's just reality and it's reality that so many people face and a part of recovery is pulling things into the light and really addressing them. Uh, and it's just like with workplace conflict, right? What happens is there's a problem and we just wish it away. We hope it away. We don't want to deal with it, which usually makes things worse, right? And our culture embraces and just a lot of magical thinking. Do we think the left versus the right is going to get any better if we don't, if we're not the one to bridge the gap, if we're not the one to talk about difficult issues? Um, So a lot of it is just embracing the awkward, um, deciding that health is worth it mental health, community health, um, loving ourselves and our neighbor is worth being realistic and, and being open and not hiding. And so I said earlier that uh, one of my goals this year was to pr- try to be more present, um, that I was going to ask you if you have any tips for that. You clearly are accomplishing a huge amount of things, and you've got the same distractions um, everybody else has that come at you constantly. What do you do to try to remain present and and focused on what's important? It's hard. <laughs> I spend way too much doing stupid things on social media, you know, um, scrolling through Facebook. But one thing that I have realized um, with starting the business, and I think this goes to it, is I could just des- I get to decide if I'm going to work all the time or not. And also, I've also learned this through writing books is that I know that my mind is kind of always going in the background. So if I'm doing something else, if I'm having a family meal or I'm just hanging out, my mind is working stuff out in the back. I don't have to constantly, and it doesn't mean that I'm distracted. It's not, it's, it's not like I'm there and I'm not there. I think if you just sort of are in a creative process, it's always with you and you learn how to kind of push it to the background so that when you come to sit down and write uh, or you're producing something for a meeting you have, um, you've given yourself a break. Like you really have given yourself a break and now you're sort of ready to go back into it. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but breaks, even scrolling through social media, I've come to realize if I don't do too much, it's a good distraction. It's a good time down. It's a good unwinding um, and so I, I really do think if you don't work too much, you'll work better right? if you give yourself time. Thank you so much for uh, taking some time out and talking to us today. If if uh, either your book or your the work you're doing uh, for corporations, if any of that is of interest to any of our listeners, where can they find you? Uh, you can go to my website. So um, it's 3pconflictrestoration.com. The name of my company is Third Party Workplace Com- um, Restoration Services. Um, so you can just go to my website and find me there and um, be happy to talk with you. And thank you to all you listeners who've joined Mary, Emily, and Luke and me today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com. 